I'm going to take a step back to answer Judith's question and then from what Xiao said and then come back to the pandemic. And so I think what we see is that, you know, as many of you know, China has long been home to one of the world's most restrictive media internet landscapes. And in fact, it is home to the most sophisticated and multi-layered apparatus of censorship um, and surveillance in the world. Um, but as Xiao was saying, over the past five to 10 years, particularly under Xi Jinping's leadership, it's become even more restrictive. And so I think there's three trends that we've seen um, that are relevant and really tie into the conversation about the pandemic. Uh, the first is we've seen tightened, expanded, and more automated internet censorship in China. So um, Freedom House, every year we do an annual assessment of internet freedom in 65 countries around the world. It's called Freedom on the Net. Um, and last year, uh, China emerged as the worst abuser of internet freedom for the fourth year in a row. But perhaps even more interesting is China's score today relative to when we started the project 10 years ago. And there's been a notable decline. So it's not just that China is one of the most restrictive places for the internet anywhere in the world, where people actually have access, say not North Korea, but even relative to the amount of freedom and communication and anonymity um, that Chinese people were able to have 10 years ago, the space has shrunk considerably um, over, the last, um, over the last decade. Um, and one of the thing, the ways that's manifested and had already begun in 2018 and 2019 um, is that the scale of content removals and website closures and social media account deletions um, was expanding. And so what used to be that if you wrote something that the, the, the Chinese government didn't like or the social media company was afraid would get them in trouble, the comment would be deleted. And that still happens en masse. But increasingly, we're seeing that people's actual full accounts are being deleted. And particularly on WeChat, which is this uh, social media platform that kind of combines Facebook and ePay um, and all kinds of different functions and is really essential to people's day-to-day -day life in China today, we're seeing more and more people having their whole account be shut down. Um, we're also seeing more um, deletion and, and restrictions on apolitical topics and platforms, entertainment, dating, celebrity gossip. And increasingly, the Chinese applications are able to um, automate censorship more and expand and the, the sophistication and, and breadth of the censorship um, by using artificial intelligence. So I think that's one of the things um, that we were seeing before the pandemic. One of the other things is that the topics of censorship and what is considered sensitive information has also expanded. Um, so I think a lot of people will think of, you know, Tiananmen Square, Tibet, Falun Gong, Uyghurs, any kind of democracy movement, uh, exposure of human rights abuses. But when we look at, and Freedom House has analyzed a lot of the censorship directives that actually Xiao's uh, team at China Digital Times obtains and publishes and translates, um, we've done content analysis and one of the top topics of breaking news that is regularly censored is information about public health and safety. So I think that's where you see what happened with regards to the pandemic has not been an anomaly. It was something that was perhaps um, going to happen at one point or another, simply because of the systematic censorship um, and restrictions that surround even topics of, of, of public health and safety in China. I think the other thing, um, the second trend I would say, um, is, is that the authorities are increasingly resorting to legal reprisals. So again, it's not just that your comment will be censored, um, but people are, are basically being detained and, and, and jailed. And Judith mentioned that China is the, the world's largest um, leading jailer of journalists. And we do see um, cases, even fairly recently, there was a professional journalist who was sentenced to 15 years in prison um, for exposing corruption. But actually, when you look at it, professional journalists still comprise a fairly small proportion of Chinese citizens who are detained or imprisoned for sharing information what's happening in the country. And it's largely because of the, the institutionalized censorship of the media that doesn't actually usually allow their reports to even make it to print. And so when you look at lists of jail journalists, you see a lot of citizen journalists, a lot of bloggers, a lot of activists, a lot of members of ethnic minorities like Uyghurs and Tibetans. But even those lists um, are still a drop in the bucket in terms of the number of ordinary Chinese citizens um, that uh, get detained for online offenses. And you see that in reports from grassroots um, websites and human rights groups from court verdicts that we've looked at. And so one of the things that we've seen is that in this space too, um, the various categories of Chinese citizens that risk being detained or obtaining legal reprisals for accessing or sharing information online has also expanded in recent years. And so we've seen more people who use Twitter being um, uh, called in by police. We've seen people who um, get detained and even sentenced to prison either for using or often for sharing 
various tools that allow people to jump the Great Firewall, uh, various activists who operate civil society or human rights related websites being sentenced to very long prison terms. And all of these activities just a few years ago were really considered to be on the safe side of the red lines. And so that's, again, one of the reasons why you see somebody like Li Wenliang and some of the doctors in Wuhan basically thinking that, you know, there's this vibes and I'm going to share something on a relatively private chat group with my colleagues um, saying that we have this uh, uh, emerging SARS-like virus in our city and you want to take precautions. And so they don't even expect that they're going to face some kind of legal reprisal, uh, but then they do. And in his case, it was a reprimand and he was forced to uh, retract uh, and sign this kind of very communist, I would say, you know, kind of confession. Um, but we see a lot of cases of, of ordinary WeChat users being sentenced to prison and, um, and facing prosecution. And I'll give you a few examples from 2019. I think it gives a good sense for uh, the scope and, and of how common actually uh, this is becoming uh, in China for people whose names we might not see you know, headlines say in, in, in a New York Times article or that many of us might not have heard of. So we saw, for example, a fellow who wasn't even just writing on WeChat, but was just moderating a popular WeChat account that shared news from outside China for people inside the firewall. Um, and he was sentenced to two years in prison. A professor from Guangdong province was jailed for three and a half years for posting images related to the to, to people who practice Falun Gong, the persecution they face in China. A 22-year-old Tibetan monk was arrested for expressing uh, concerns about Beijing's policies related to Tibetan language. Um, and, and for Uyghurs in, in Xinjiang, we don't even know accurate numbers for how many people have been detained and sentenced for uh, simply for using social media. But one case that we do know about was a 24-year-old soccer player um, who was sent to a re-education camp because he'd used WeChat to contact family members who had fled the country. So I think that just gives a little bit of context, context again to how often it actually happens in China uh, that ordinary users, um, uh, especially of WeChat, uh, face uh, legal repercussions. Repercussions, and then the third trend I want to talk about, which kind of brings us back to more of the the professional, of the profession of journalism, uh, is the decline in investigative journalism. And so you see a situation where Chinese journalists have long operated in an extremely restrictive media environment, um, but even in that, and often reported very courageously about all kinds of scandals, tainted vaccines, tainted milk, um, all kinds of uh, incidents, bullet train crashes. Um, uh, but we have seen that the space and the conditions for investigative journalism uh, have shrunk since 2013. Um, and in fact, that the actual number of investigative journalists has declined. So there was one um, study by some Chinese academics that found that between 2011 and 2017, uh, the number of investigative journalists in China uh, decreased by almost by half. Um, and even since then, we've seen some of the real leading investigative journalists in China whole teams that have just been that were just disbanded. And a lot of those teams were at these um, uh, commercially oriented news outlets. So not the main uh, state run media that we often think of the People's Daily or, or China Central Television, but a uh, smaller uh, commercially oriented outlets um, uh, that are still partially state owned, uh, but are able of are a bit more autonomous. Um, um, but they've also, a lot, number of them have been shut down. Their investigative journalism teams have been gutted. Um, and even the ones that, when they do get an article out, there are all kinds of new controls that are in place to say stop um, internet portals from reposting them. Um, and that was one kind of a ban that happened, for example, to Caixin. And so those are three of the trends that we've seen, I would say, emerging and evolving over the last few years, particularly in 2019. When we look at what happened during the pandemic and kind of bringing it back to the present, uh, there are three points that I would, I would raise. Uh, one, as Xiao was mentioning, we saw a lot of examples of Chinese police working very hard to muzzle independent source of information, uh, particularly at the height of, of the outbreak in Wuhan. And, and Xiao mentioned three of the, the very courageous citizen journalists who had been able to film from within the city who were detained. And as far as we know, one uh, has, has gone home, but two, I think, are, are still, we haven't heard from them. Um, but those are actually just the tip of the iceberg. Um, one NGO, uh, Chinese human rights defenders has documented almost 900 cases cases um, of Chinese internet users who were detained uh, through, I think it was till early April, uh, for, quote, spreading rumors. But from the cases um, whose details we know and we've looked at, it's very clear that many of them were actually reporting firsthand observations of what was happening in their lives or in their community, especially in Wuhan, or criticizing the Chinese government's response, rather than, say, maliciously spreading some kind of disinformation regarding the pandemic. 
Um, and similarly, the, the Falun Dafa Information Center is also reporting an uptick of arrests of Falun Gong practitioners throughout China, also numbering in the hundreds, including many who were trying to share uncensored news about the pandemic or tools for how to jump the firewall. I think the second thing we've seen is that um, social media platforms like WeChat have cracked down a large number of personal accounts of people who were sharing even innocuous or factual, in some cases like state approved content, and people had their accounts shut down in the middle of a pandemic. People are in lockdown, they can't reach their families, uh, they're having to order all of their food online and take out and things like that, and their link to the outside world is just shut down just like that. And there's really like no appeals process, it just happens all of a sudden and that's it. Um, and that we saw, saw lots of reports of reports of that happening. And the third thing, which I, I kind of always like to try to end on an optimistic note, <laughs> um, actually relates to the commercial media and investigative journalists. And it, it was really inspiring to see uh, how many risks they were willing to take uh, to cover what was happening in Wuhan. We used to see these outbursts happen more often. They bec become rarer, and so it really stood out. But several commercialized and financial news outlets in China um, really tried to outpace censors or even directly defy them. And in fact, a lot of what we know about the early cover-up is thanks to reporting by journalists inside China. A lot of those articles were then, of course, censored inside China. Uh, but then that's when you kind of see this a broader array of ways in which information circulates despite the censors. Um, archives outside the Great Firewall, all kinds of creative ways, uh, coding, emojis, Korean, Google Translate, all, all kinds of ways in which these articles were shared within the firewall. And then a whole array of outlets, uh, Chinese language outlets, um, outside of China, in Hong Kong, and Taiwan, the Diaspora, Radio Free Asia, even say the New York Times Chinese language website, picking up on these stories and information. Um, and all of that actually reaching back in various ways to people inside China. So I, I think I would just end on that, that one of the things that we see is that um, censorship and controls over the media have tightened under Xi Jinping in ways that would have previously maybe been unimaginable to a lot of us who were following, uh, who have been following China for some time. And, um, but but um, but important information does still break through.